I'm Savannah. I'm Alicia. This is Burden of Proof. Welcome back. Yay. Another day, another dollar. <laughs> we don't get any dollars for this. <laughs> and this is once a week, so this makes no sense. But yeah. anyway, you ready? Yeah. I don't think we have any business. I don't think so. <gasps> Yay. I don't think people want to hear the mundane. Yeah, not really. Let's get into the murder. They okay. like that. Yeah. All right. Pretty quick episode. I mean, intro. Probably a pretty quick episode, too. <laughs> This week, we are doing Louise Vermilia. This is an old-timey case. So I put love on old-timey. Yes, put on your garb. How old-timey? Late 1800s, early 1900s. All right. Put on my petticoat. Yes. And your, right. your hat. I think they my wore hat. hats. My corset. Yeah. All right. And go pee in the streets. Okay. <laughs> well, now you pee in a bucket and then and just then dump, dump it, it into the streets. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, All gosh. Right. I love indoor plumbing. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we are going to be talking about, again, Louise Familia. And we're going to start at the ripe age of 16 when Louise set off to be married. She was born to two Prussian immigrants. And Louise was used to farm work and a big family. Um, she was the eldest daughter and one of 11 children, which I know is pretty normal then, but it still baffles me it, now. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of kids. <laughs> My husband's grandparents came from huge families like that. It's insane to me. My family didn't like kids enough to have none of them have that many kids. <laughs> um, yeah. That's too many too many kids. Or maybe it's that they didn't like each other enough to have that many kids. <laughs> I wasn't gonna say it, but okay. <laughs> Either is possible. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, my fiance comes from a big family, but not that big. There's six of them, not 11. Yeah. So Louise was a strong, very built girl, and she was whisked away to a Fred Brinkamp. Brinkamp. And on April 2nd, 1885, they were married and moved to a village in Lake County, Illinois. Okay. It was all in Illinois. This whole area of like Lake and Cook County. Okay. It was during this section of her life where we see some of the weird stuff come up for Louise because we don't have anything about her childhood, really. um, But we do have one quote that I think will give you some insight into the mind of this woman. Okay. This was said after the fact, like later. Yeah. And this isn't a spoiler because this is a true crime podcast. Why do you think we're here? So obviously she's not a great person. This is the local undertaker. About the time of her first marriage. He said it later, but this is like in context. He's talking about the time of her first marriage. Okay. Got it. Quote, I never saw such a woman for being anxious to work around dead bodies, said E.M. Block. Um, It was in the town of Barrington. She actually seemed to enjoy it. I never employed her, but she went around and said she was working for me. At every death, she would hear of it almost as soon as I. and wouldn't be far behind me at the house to take care of the body. More than that, the woman seemed to glory in thinking about prospective deaths. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) So he never paid her, but she went around saying that she worked for him. And she was all up in the deaths of the town. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah. I mean, I think we have talked about there's a fine line between... You know, having interest in, like, the sciences and stuff. And so being fascinated in that way. But Mm -hmm. there's, like, then you just, you go a little too far. And I don't know. Yeah, we've not talked about that before. Being that eager is a little little questionable. Well, and she's not a little kid. Like, I think it's normal for little kids to be interested in, like, the science and things behind death. Yeah. Um, But when you get to that older age, well, I don't know. Maybe that's not fair to say because there are people who do undertaking and, and, you know, autopsy texts and, and... medical examiner so maybe that's not fair to say i'm just thinking like this is weird you don't work for oh it, yeah no i think that you know well i had a friend in high school that he wanted to be like an undertaker at one point in high school and he was kind of weird but i don't know i like i said i think it's a fine line yeah i, I think, think it depends on the person to, yeah. but but especially in the time period for a woman it definitely was not yeah. The typical. Most women would be like, oh, 
I just imagine most women back then like like faint. We're like fainting. putting the back of our like, hands to our heads and we're fainting uh, uh. because the general consensus was that women couldn't handle certain things. Yes. Although they definitely handled death a lot more than we do today. Exactly. And so many people died at home and in front of family mm-hmm. and stuff. But nevertheless, I think we can all agree that it's a little weird that she was so eager. Yes. And leave it at that. Exactly. <laughs> So, um, yeah. Yep. Fine line between um, liking death and being infatuated with death, I think. Because as true crime lovers, we feel like we like true crime, but it's not. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm not love. like fascinated with death. I think there are those people that yes. are for sure. But me personally, I'm not. It's not so much the gory or the death part. I'm fascinated by the human condition of how do we yes. get there yes. how does this happen how do people i am not fascinated with the dead i'm fascinated with the living and yeah. how we got here for yeah. sure so this you know was a beginning of a long career as a black widow for louise you see it was 1893 when louise killed her first husband fred and received a five thousand dollar life insurance policy after his passing So I'm going to be really honest here and just say that I could not figure out his age at the time that they got married because one source said he was 24 when they got married in 1885, right? Yeah, 1885. But then when he passed away due to his age, nobody was concerned about how he died. Everybody just said it was a heart attack. Um, And then another source said he was 60 when he died. So I don't understand how he would have been 24 in 1885 and then eight years later he would have been uh, 60. Yeah. (laughs) So somewhere there's a misconstruity, but one source, like every source that I read said that nobody was really concerned with his cause of death. It was clear that he was older and that it was some sort of health related issue. Nobody thought it was murder. Gotcha. But he didn't just leave behind an insurance policy. He also left behind six children including two that rather quickly met the same fate as their father. Oh. Cora Brinkamp. I keep wanting to say Brinkham or like on the brink, but it's Brinkamp. Okay. Was the first to die at age eight and her sister Florence was three and a half and she also passed away. Okay. I just want to make sure that I'm getting, that I'm on track. So these children were his children with Louise or they were children Pre, it was a blended family. Yes, some of them were his kids from a prior marriage, and some of them were hers. It's you cannot tell which ones were which, even by age. There's I mean, not always ages for all six of them. Okay, so gotcha. it's like because of how long ago it was. There are some people who found like a census who can who could age the older children, but the younger ones are difficult. The only reason we know the younger ones here is because of that's when they died. Okay, we have a definitive date of death. So we're not 100% sure these were her biological children. Yes. Um, Florence would have been, for sure. Cora, it's questionable. I would think so, because she was eight, and they had been married about eight years. Okay. But it could, I mean, was she an older eight, or was she a younger eight? I don't know. So Doesn't matter, yeah. I would assume that Cora and Florence were both her biological children. Okay. But we will see that she has stepchildren from this marriage later down the road, so. Yes. We know that there's a blended family. So a few years later, in 1906, Louise took her remaining children and moved to the big city, Chicago. Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear me sing. But that's <laughs> We're all thinking it. Um, it was in Chicago that she then claimed the life of her stepdaughter from her husband, who was 26, and her name was Lillian. The coroner labeled the death acute nephritis, which means swelling around the kidney, kidney. area. Yeah. Look at you go. I was a medical assistant. Dang, girl. <laughs> I had to Google that. Well, I mean, most people would. <laughs> so I'm not a doctor. Nothing close to a doctor. Kind of the opposite of a doctor, really. But this is a lot of death. Yes. Around this family. And um, this is when people started to whisper. They were whispering about how the family must be cursed because there were too many weird deaths to be normal anymore. And their best answer was that, obviously... They were cursed. No. Obviously. What does a woman in the early 1900s do when her family is dying and rumors are being spread that her family is cursed? 
become a fortune teller. I don't know. <laughs> she gets remarried. Oh. Well. So. I didn't know anybody would remarry her if she was cursed. Oh, but. don't you worry. Plenty of people do. <laughs> so around this time, Louise married um, a man named Charles Vermilia, who she ends up keeping that name through the rest of her life, who was 59 when, they got, when, he, when he married Louise. So she's still in her 20s? Ah, yeah. Late 20s, probably. We don't have and a date 59. of birth for her. I know that was common back then, yeah. but ugh. I know. Yeah. Um, so about three years after their marriage, Charles dies quite suddenly. A very, what? very serious illness struck him down at his prime at 62. At his prime? <laughs> <laughs> um, he left his widow with $1,000 and a home in Crystal Lake, Illinois, which is like 50 miles from Chicago. Okay. Coincidence, he also leaves behind kids. And suddenly, Luisa's relatively new stepchild named Terry passes away. Hmm. What's really strange about this is that he had recently been arguing with Luis about the sale of that Crystal Lake property that she got left. Weird. And then he just, he died. It's just such a coincidence, right? So weird. So sad. That's what everyone around them thought. They thought, oh, so sad for Luisa or Luis. She's, everybody be dying. <laughs> everybody be dying. Poor Louisa. Louise. 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 Not Louise. <laughs> She's not a Hispanic man. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, later in the year 1910, Louise receives yet another life insurance payout. This time, it was a result of one of the sons from her first marriage passing away. Frank died of a sudden illness that that gave Louise a $1,200 payment. So he had previously been married, but then he got a divorce, which made Louise his next of kin. Gotcha. Legally. So that's, she got the money. And it was a very recent divorce. Huh. So it was a recent divorce, but he had been divorced or separated long enough to get engaged to a woman, a woman named Elizabeth Nolan. Okay. It was to his new fiance that he expressed his concern. He told her that he was going to go the same way that his father had gone and indicated that his stepmother was to blame. So people suspected her, or at least family suspected her, but didn't think they could prove anything or no, I think this no is records like, of them trying to go to police or anything. Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to kind of break the first wall here a little bit and before we get into the next few murders. I'm going to go ahead and answer the question. How is she killing these people? Would you like to guess? I mean, because they all are dying from seemingly natural causes or illnesses. So I'm guessing some kind of poison or something. Yes. Drum roll, please. Da -da 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 -da. I'm really bad at drumming. Same. It's arsenic. <laughs> Shocking. Woo! Um, and at the very least, it was poison. So we're not positive that it was arsenic in every case, but we're pretty sure. Yeah. Um, Louise had a special white pepper shaker that she would keep in her kitchen and sometimes use on certain people's food. And it was a result in them getting very sick very, very quickly. Hmm. Now, what does arsenic poisoning do, you ask? The answer is vomiting, abdominal pain, diarrhea, um, and then numbness tingling the extremities muscle cramping and then death yes sounds like a delightful way to go yes the reason that i stopped there and broke down what she was actually doing is because it's this point in her life where louise starts devolving a little bit so she started pointing point pointing <laughs> <laughs> she starts poisoning acquaintances and friends rather than her family she opened her house into a boarding house um, because she was kind of near like a railroad or some construction gotcha. zones. Um, and she began poisoning a railroad worker named Jason Rupert. He fell ill dining at the home and died about two days later. Ding, ding, ding. Let's check the clock. It's been a few years since Luis got married. So socially, it's time. Let's get remarried. Time to get married. She marries a train conductor who had been boarding in her home. His name was Richard Smith. But don't worry, he didn't have to stay married to this monster for very long. Because he died two days after their wedding. Oh, God. So mysterious. 
That's so weird. So many thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot collect them all. Yeah. So my first thought was that branching out, one could have assumed that killing her family member, she was just after the money. Yes. But what good does it do her to kill borders and other people that she has no connection to? Yes. Well, what does she get out of that? That's the question, isn't it? Hmm. Maybe at the end we'll have more to say about this. Okay. But you know who else thought it was really weird that he died two days after they got married? Let me guess. His kids. No. His wife. Oh, God. <laughs> he was actually still married. He had an estranged oh, God. wife. Um, and he was technically still married at the time that he married, quote unquote, Luis. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and his wife thought it was really weird. And I kind of think that this is such a testament to, um, I, this is such a side note, sorry. When you love somebody, like you get married to them and you love them and something happens, even if you're not together anymore, you're still going to be like, hey, that that was mine. And <laughs> uh, you're, yeah, it is. I'm sure it's a weird, like Matt and I have had to watch our parents kind of go through those situations. I mean, I don't know what exactly was going through their heads. Yeah. Um. But it is a strange feeling. I mean, I've had somebody die that I dated and I hadn't talked to the person in yeah. 20 years or something ridiculous and it threw me for a loop. I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So she believed that her husband was married for one of three reasons. And this is her quote. Quote, either Miss Vermilia loved Smith and was afraid he would desert her or he was murdered for his money. Or C.C. Borson, the undertaker, thought to be in love, in love with Miss Vermilia, was jealous. While her motive in the earlier deaths of her family members was clearly for financial gain. Sorry, quote stopped and I kept reading my notes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another undertaker. That's a different undertaker than before. Okay. So this is our first sign again in history that she was involved with another undertaker. And she was, like, at the funeral home with the bodies again. Cozying up. Cozying up. We've all been there. We've all, like, sat at our love's work. Yeah. Waiting. Exactly. Hanging out. So was she also seeing this undertaker, perhaps? I don't know. Hmm. So that was her theory. She thought either she loved him and thought he was going to leave her for his estranged wife. Um, he was murdered for his money or the undertaker did it and was because it was he was jealous. Those are her theories. All pretty viable. I'm going on the second. Because if Richard had not legally been married and he died, who would have gotten his money? Yes. Luis. And I'm assuming she didn't know he was legally married. So. Yeah. So to answer your question, why was she doing this? I think it was still for financial gain. Okay. But because what about the border? You said she started with like friends and yeah, border. Some of it. Yeah, I think Rupert is kind of Rupert and the next victim. Um, well, just pretty much Rupert were the only ones that we could really see that had no financial benefit. So maybe she just didn't like him. Yeah. I don't She's know like, what was going on with that, but who knows? Or maybe she tried to cozy up to him. Yeah, and it didn't go. And he's like, no, thank you, ma'am. I don't like your white pepper. Which is really interesting that she's trying to marry all of these men because she's not known as an attractive woman. She was very stocky and she always married older men because... Well, there you go. You know? So, hang in there. We've got, we've got one more murder to get through. Okay. Arthur Bissonnette and his father came to stay at the boarding house. Arthur was a 26-year-old police officer, and it was unclear exactly why they were in the home. But in October 1911, both of the Boisonettes started having some severe ab abdominal pain. Arthur did pass away at Mercy Hospital afterwards, but his father lived, and he got to tell the police about their meal at the home, including the white pepper that had been sprinkled onto their food. Can I just say that 
I've had, uh, probably not everybody uses white pepper. Have you used white pepper? Do you have white pepper at home? Yes. Okay. So, like, can we be in agreement that, ba- not that I've used arsenic before, but I'm pretty sure they don't look exactly the same. Probably not, but if you've never seen it, how would you know? True. You know what I'm saying? And arsenic has no taste, so they're probably yeah. like, this is ridiculous. I don't even taste it. But oh, white pepper is strong. It's so strong. But this is white pepper. It might not be that strong. They don't know. They're like, oh, what is this weird thing? It's white pepper. It doesn't taste any different. It's mild. That's the conversation. I don't know. People. Just saying. People. Saying. Well, so for you guys to know, white pepper is strong. <laughs> it's white not pepper mild. is not like super white either. Yes. And I just imagine that arsenic is more of a white powder, like whiter. Yes. I would. I would believe. <laughs> I'm using my Italian hands. <laughs> it's just wider. <laughs> even though I'm not Italian. Um, um, yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. It's how they ended it's up. It's just hard to believe. Like, the kids, I understand. The, the I don't know. It's yeah. just crazy to me. You're... Okay. Well, his father's testimony led the Chicago Police Department to do an autopsy. Well, not the police department. But the medical examiner. <laughs> to do an autopsy on Arthur's body. And it revealed arsenic poisoning. Um, Vermilia was taken into custody soon after its discovery. Um, and there's some speculation as to why she killed Arthur and if it was precipitated by financial motives. Mm-hmm. So here's how the story is rumored to go. This is the theater. <laughs> the theater. <laughs> Louise helped Arthur get into the home guard, which is essentially a militia because he wasn't qualified from the military. Okay. She said in order to thank her, he was to make a will and name her the sole beneficiary on the policy that he would have after he got employed. Mm. She was also under the impression that they were going to be married. And so she told him, well, I'll make you the beneficiary on a life insurance policy after we get married. Arthur had written a will prior to his death, but he actually named his true fiance, Lydia Rivard as the beneficiary to his estate. The kicker is, Luis was the witness on the document. So she knew, right? She denies having knowledge of signing the document, but obviously, like, she's listed as the witness. And I'm assuming that the reason that he died so quickly was because he lied to her about how his will was going to go and that they were not going to get married because when she signed, when she signed that will, she witnessed it, she knew she was must have been realized that she was not his fiance. His fiance was a woman named Lydia, and she wasn't going to get his money. And so this is pointless. Only Luis will ever know the true story of what happened. Okay. <laughs> I so you decide to kill him anyway. It's- yeah, she was going to kill him either way. If she had married him and gotten his money, she well, definitely yeah. was going to kill him. Well, yeah, but then you get the money. But so this killing is probably more out of anger. From what we can tell, yes. Yeah. That's to me, it's just, that's crazy. Like, you're getting greedy now. Yeah. Should have let that one go. Cause well, yeah, because that's the cause one that's got how you caught. got caught. Yeah. But that's just it, is that you've managed to have all these people die and you get their money. And you've not been caught when you start going around killing people just because... Then you're going to have a problem. Yeah. So. Well, this is burden of proof, so that's definitely not the end of the story for us because we're going to talk about the court. Yes. So after Arthur's father talked with the homicide detective and he mentioned the white pepper, they instantly knew what was kind of going on. They looked for arsenic. They found arsenic. They arrested Luis. Somehow they ended up putting her on house arrest and not in jail. I'm not sure how that happened. Probably because she's think, just a dainty little yeah, woman. I was going to say, I think it that used to be more common for yeah. women. A few weeks later, though, she was rushed to the hospital after having some strange symptoms. She'd been poisoning herself with arsenic, her own little white pepper moment. Hmm. How on the earth did they not go in the house and make sure she didn't have any more freaking arsenic? <laughs> Are they dumb? I don't understand. Well... 
So she'd been poisoning herself since October 28th, and she was taken to the hospital on November 4th. She lived, but she was very, very sick and had some heart-related comorbidities. She was eventually released from the hospital, but not before she was struck with a permanent paralysis. Mm. Yeah. So she was still forced to attend all court proceedings, but she did so in a wheelchair due to her paralysis. Yeah. The prosecution decided that going in with all of the charges would be too much. And so they were worried about overcharging her. They decided they were just going to charge her with Arthur's murder as it was the most recent. He was a civil servant. He was young. That's who they had arrested her for. They thought at the time that's who they had the most evidence for. Yes. Yes. That makes sense. Yeah. But the problem was, is that even the evidence that they had kind of turned out to be circumstantial. Um, the prosecution met with the judge at a conference, and they ended up doing what's called a null prosecute, prosecute, prosecute. Yes. Null prosecute is what it's called, <laughs> um, which essentially means that they were going to rescind the case before a verdict was rendered. They were like, yeah, actually, we're going to not. <laughs> Um, and they did this because they found out that Arthur had actually been taking a medication that already contained arsenic. And so oh. they were like, mm, that's not, we're not going to nail it on the head. Yeah. The prosecutor moved on to Richard Smith, which is um, the man before who mm -hmm. she had married and the yes. wife. And he stated that the evidence was strongest there. Um, quote from the prosecution says, there are several cases to which for Miss Vermilia may be tried, and I don't want to try her more than once. For that reason, I want to pick the strongest one and have concluded that Smith is the strongest one. That's his quote. You know, so. She was rearrested and charged for the murder of Richard Smith. Evidence of the arsenic poisoning was found in his liver via autopsy conducted by, this is a very um, coroner name, Walter S. Hines. Haynes. Walter S. Haynes. Haynes. So H A I N E S. Mm. So interesting Haynes. spelling. Okay. Um, Walter S. Haynes. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> he was an expert chemist at Rush Medical College. His findings showed that quote arsenic in sufficient qualities in the viscera of the two men to cause death. Basically, he had enough in his system to kill two people. Like he had a lot. Oh wow! Yeah. So they picked her up again, arrested and detained her, and she was in jail. Um, while she was there, she attempted suicide again. Okay. Well, that answers my question, because I was thinking now the obvious conclusion would be that she poisoned herself to try and kill herself so that she didn't have to deal with yes. the drama, the embarrassment, the speculation. Or... Was she trying to poison herself mm. to make it look like, oh, I didn't do it? Because then she lit. Yeah. No, but that was, answers my question. It was because she didn't want to <laughs> do it. Was it was because she didn't want to yeah. deal with it. And she was probably depressed because she was recently paralyzed and like that's hard. Yeah. I feel like everybody that I see testimonies of that go through oh, that, yeah. it's definitely a really hard thing mentally. So. So maybe she initially did it to be like, oh, look, it wasn't it me. It wasn't me. Maybe. And then she actually, no. Yeah, well, she Probably lived, not. So. She probably just. Yeah. Um, so she lived and the trial began on the 21st of March, 1912 and lasted for 16 days. Uh, and then the case was resubmitted for trial 10 days later, which ended in another hung jury. They had two hung juries and had to retry the case. Both times. Um, wh wh why? <laughs> Because the people who were thought she was innocent couldn't be convinced otherwise, and the guilty people... Well, no, I get how a hung jury happens. <laughs> I mean, like, how do they not see her guilt? Um, because a lot of the evidence was deemed circumstantial. People. Oh, well, that's just the it burden looks of looks like a duck. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, most of the time. Yes. Because most of the time when you hear people get convicted on circumstantial evidence... It it doesn't all add up. It doesn't yeah. fully make sense if you really think about it. Yeah. But when it all makes sense. Yeah. Well, and were they able to, like, despite them only charging her with the one death, they probably aren't able no. to bring in information from the others. Definitely not. 
<sighs> okay. So I'll get over that. <laughs> well, give me a minute. Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so I was gonna kind of explain jury selection issues that they were having while you process that. So the the case was really popular in the media, and there are tons of newspaper clippings and little like art pieces that they use. I'm definitely gonna post some. They're really cool. They kind of show what she looked like and how they perceived her. And there's some photographs, which is also kind of cool. Okay, cool. They were having trouble finding a party that was unbiased based because of all of the news. Yes. In addition, they were also having problems finding men that would be able to inflict the death penalty on a woman. Yeah. They ended up with an all-male jury. And by October 12th, 1912, she was still in custody awaiting trial along with fellow murderer Louisa Lindoff. Lindelof. Lind- Lindloff. <laughs> I should really read these names before. I- <laughs> What's crazy is that I read them all before I started, like out loud at my house. Thinking, yeah, it doesn't matter. You still, yeah, you still stutter. Thing. It doesn't matter. The other thing is, too, they look really easy to say. And you're like, oh, yeah, I got this. And then you start saying it. And you're like, oh, no, it's difficult. Yeah. So she was in jail with another little Black Widow moment. We're going to talk about that at the very end. Okay. On the 28th of June, 1913... Luis Vermilia was released on a $5,000 bail due to concerns for her failing health and exposure to the summer heat in a non-air-conditioned jail while she was pending her trial for the poisoning of Richard Smith. Did they have air conditioning back then? I don't know. Apparently not in this jail. <laughs> well, no, not in the jail, but, but probably I didn't even else. think they had air conditioning. I don't know. Then. But they had fans? <laughs> I don't know. No idea. I should have paid attention in history. <laughs> hey, yeah. Siri. I'm going to be looking that up after. <laughs> I'm going to look it up now. <laughs> when did air conditioning... <laughs> hold, hold momentarily. Do, 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 do. 1960s. Most homes I did was... not have it. So I think it was just really hot in there. And they were like... Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's... okay. I don't know. Okay. I'm anyway. not trying to. I'm not trying to like you know. No, you're cause totally problems fair. in your story. But when you said non air conditioning, I was like, but wait, no place it's was air conditioned. She needs to be found. I mean, yeah, obviously, being in a home is more comfortable yeah, than a jail. Exactly. But on April 18th, 1915, a conference was held between the assistant state attorney Michael Sullivan and the state attorney. Um, his last name was Hoyne. They don't have his first name. I didn't look. Attorney Hoyne. Um, regarding the continuation of the trial, they decided that it would be impossible to obtain a conviction with the Smith indictment. Sullivan remarked and said, we can only see that another trial would entail a heavy cost without any assurance of being able to show any strong evidence. Per the request of her attorney, the charges were then dropped. She oh. led a quiet life following the dismissal of her charges and no further documentation exists of her after that. She probably didn't live that much longer having probably all not. those health problems. And honestly, I mean, she punished herself. Yeah. Paralyzing herself with arsenic. Yeah, for real. Also, what a small world. Um, That happened on my birthday, and Sullivan is my mom's maiden name. So it's a really weird little passage of time there. You just um, gave away all of your passwords. None of those are my <laughs> passwords. I'm just kidding. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then... She was estimated to have amassed a total of $15,000 from the nine deaths. So, obviously. Which is quite a bit of money. Well, yeah. And so, obviously, the next thing I did was do the conversion. And I based it off of the year 1905, which is, like, the middle ground of when she would have had all this Mm -hmm. money. $15,000 in 1905 would have been $505,903.38. Today. Today. That's almost, that's over half a million dollars. Yeah. So, you're living all right. I think she's okay. You know? Yep. So, that's the story of Louise Vermilia. Unfortunately, she uh, was free at the end of her life. So, the other thing that was kind of interesting when I was researching this case is that there were mentions of two other female murderers in this area in the same time frame. Bella Guinness and... She happened. What? I love that name. I'm like 90% sure it's Guinness. No, I'm Why like, wouldn't it be? I don't know. Is it spelled like the beer? Well, now I'm second guessing how it's spelled. 
<laughs> because <laughs> I just said I love the name. I wasn't questioning. No, I am. Watch, it's going to be like Gin Ye or something. <laughs> <laughs> I read it so fast. Oh, it's Guinness. Gunness. It's Gunness. There's no Gunness. So. All right. It's Gunness. It's not as cool. I don't like it as much, but yeah. it's still. That could have very well just been a typo on my end. I. <laughs> My bad. Uh, Bella Gunness happened three years earlier, and she was a piece of work. I did a little bit of preliminary research on her last night when I kept seeing the name pop up. It was in all the newspaper articles. They kept comparing her to this Bella Gunness who yeah. happened. Th- she was arrested three years prior. Okay. And then at the end of her time in incarceration, Luis was in jail with a woman named Louisa Lindelof. Lindelof. And off. that I can't say right at the end there and she was also a female murderer so I'm kind of thinking maybe a little mini series is in order to cover those three women All right so that I'm be- fascinated I, I am, am too. fascinated by how many female murderers there were kind of in that time frame yeah. because they're so underestimated mm-hmm. so let me tell you it was fascinating to research and to see all of the articles and the quotes of how people perceived her as this like brute woman and still nobody thought that she was i mean they they did but only her family was kind of seeing that she was killing these people until she was caught by arthur and i think that was honestly because he was a cop yeah so crazy interesting case it was I enjoyed. I don't normally i love a good modern day crime so this is out of my wheelhouse but i really enjoyed it You've done a few, so well, maybe not a few, but you did Tansler. Yeah. Thought of Tansler. But True. And I actually prefer old timey things, but I keep coming up with cases. Yeah. You know, what are you gonna do? You know picking cases. You have to is... pick cases based off your mood because if not, it's harder to research for me. Yeah. Like I kind of have a plan for like I have a list. We were just talking earlier about my list that's in my head. Mm-hmm. And I should probably put it physical somewhere. You um, definitely should. So you give me a copy of the list <laughs> so that I stop picking cases that you want to cover. <laughs> like Bernie Tita, that was on my list. I almost <laughs> did that the exact same week. Um, but yeah, so I just I go through my list and I pick which ones I want to do. Unless it's like a time specific, like the yeah. Christmas or Thanksgiving or Halloween right. cases and stuff like that. Anyway. All right. Thanks for hanging in there through this one. Hope you loved. Let us know. Yeah. Check our socials for all of those pictures of the newspaper clippings and the art that the public had created about Luis. Yes. I can't wait to see. I can show you. What they drew her, yeah. like, based on your description. If the ceiling falls in, I'm going to laugh so hard. I'm a little nervous because that's I've heard that several times. Okay. Okay. Well, we're going to go make sure we don't die. Uh, <laughs> going to make sure we don't have a mountain lion in our attic oh, space. Oh, <laughs> gosh. I'd prefer that. Honestly, I'd prefer an I'm animal kidding. to like it's the ceiling falling in. Raccoon. A raccoon or yeah. something, All right. if anything. And see, thanks so much for hanging <laughs> out for with listening. us. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening, guys. Find us on Instagram and TikTok at Burden of Proof Pod and email us at burdenofproofpod at gmail.com.